This is a CBC Podcast. Tanse, Anin, Bujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Drunk, dancing, drumming, dead. These are the stereotypes of Indigenous people we often see in the news. They're harmful, and they've stayed pretty much the same over the years, despite many people calling for change. Today on Unreserved, we're investigating the media to find out what is being done to challenge these stereotypes and hear from those pushing the industry to do better. On October 20th, the New York Times published a story called Drawn from Poverty. Art was supposed to save Canada's Inuit. It hasn't. The story, written by Catherine Porter, was immediately called into question by Inuit. Many said the story was harmful and reinforced stereotypes that don't define them. Here's a bit from the article. If any town could slip the bonds of poverty that have defined Indigenous life in Canada for so long... It should be Cape Dorset. Instead, it reflects the vast disconnect between the country's aspirations and the grim reality on the ground. When that article was published, Twitter lit up. Filmmaker Alethea Arnachuk Burrell tweeted, I am gutted by how bad this article is and that I ever welcomed the author into my house. She arrived in the North having no idea what to even write about, and I gave her a bazillion ideas. Instead, she chose to reinforce stereotypes. The reaction to the article caught the attention of the Native American Journalist Association, or NAJA. Francine Compton is the director for NAJA and an executive producer for APTN. She's from the Sandy Bay Ojibwe First Nation and is here with me now. Hi, Franny. Hi, Rosanna. Long time. Very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. You too. Now, you're not Inuit, but you are an Indigenous person working in the media. What did you think when you read this story? Well, first, I have to say that I did not want to read this story uh, after seeing the uh, reaction on Twitter, after hearing that people felt hurt by it. And I, I choose what I expose myself to. Uh, in terms of racism and stereotypes. So um, I had to read the article. Naja's members were asking if we were going to make a statement uh, Mm. about the article. And um, so it was my duty to uh, not only read the article, but draft uh, Naja's response. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that response uh, in a a second. But how did it feel to read those? As you say, you choose what you're exposed to. Uh, The authoritative tone that the New York Times took in this, and and as I understand, they take in many of their articles, that really bothered me as an Indigenous person in Canada because of their global audience and how the article portrayed uh, Indigenous life in Canada as... uh, as poverty porn. But not only that, uh, you know, as as you read in your intro, that Indigenous life in Canada was defined by poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, bothered me a lot. And I thought back on APTN's beginnings and the beginnings of a newsroom Mm -hmm. that had to now tell uh, stories and report on all Indigenous people in Canada. And I thought back to how we carefully handled uh, our coverage of Inuit. As many of us in that newsroom uh, were not Inuit, we had to look at the people and we had to look for people to be experts in the way we report on Inuit Mm -hmm. and the language that we use. And not only for Inuit, but all Indigenous people in Canada. So reading it, it put me out of place. And it really bothered me to see that type of tone being out there for a global audience Mm, mm. and with very little context and too many stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned that Naja wrote a letter, uh, released a statement to the New York Times in response. What did it say? Well, Naja demanded an audit from the New York Times, and we felt that that was the appropriate channel to go because Naja did newsroom training. Mm 
in the New York Times newsroom on how to cover indigenous people and communities. Hmm. It's a thing Naja does. Mm -hmm. And that training with the New York Times newsroom happened in May. So we felt that it was appropriate for us to ask for an audit, but also to meet with the editors uh, at the New York Times and demand an apology, which was what what everyone was demanding uh, in the first place. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we recommended they hire Indigenous journalists and editors, uh, of course, and that they take a look at their policies to see how they can do better in the future when talking to Indigenous people and covering or reporting on our communities. Mm-hmm. The article hit on so many stereotypes, many of which Nadja has put into a handy little bingo card. So instead of numbers, this bingo card has listed a bunch of different stereotypes that Nadja sees over and over again. Things like poverty, violence, suicide, casinos, something sacred. Why did you create this bingo card? Well, because we were seeing many of these stereotypes woven into stories that Uh, mainstream outlets we're doing on Indigenous peoples, not only in the U.S., but it's happening here in Canada, too. Mm. And we've seen it on Twitter where users on Twitter have said, uh, we we need this kind of thing in Canada. And so with that bingo card, I'm looking to apply it to Canadian outlets going forward now, too. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a small section of the story that I've I've pulled out here that we thought we could read out loud and play bingo together (laughs) like aunties. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So for our listeners, you can find the Naja Bingo card at our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. Uh, So I have two two, two in front of us here. I'm going to read two paragraphs from this New York Times article, and we're going to use... We're going to use our dabbers as we go. I'm going to shake that up a little bit. It's always good to shake the dabber. <laughs> yeah, you want that ink to hit you want the squares. That ink to hit the squares, yes. <laughs> okay, so here we go. It's made up of scattered homes, many boarded up, an aging ice rink, and a busy jail packed with binge drinkers. Oh, uh, let me see if I can find that. Where is that, Enrique? You played this before. It, ha- it, it, it hit alcohol and alcohol. It, it hit poverty. Poverty, yeah. Alcohol is up here. Um, with no movie theater or downtown, a general store serves as the social hub. There is a brand new high school, but only because the old one was burned down by fume-sniffing teenagers. The town is so small, the streets are unnamed. Now, is the sniffing in here? Is that where I'm looking for? Drugs. Where is that? Drugs. Okay, got that. It's, a, it's an extension, but it hits it's on poor extension. education by mentioning that school. Well, I'm not good at paling being what my mother would be. <laughs> I was never good at it, but be I'm, I'm getting better at it now. <laughs> <laughs> Almost 90% of its residents live in public housing that is crowded, run down, and has a three-year waiting list. Does it mention housing on this card? No, but I should, oh, add, but that should add that. This into the article next, yeah, did yeah. actually add some this of its own whole bingo new squares. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Uh, suicide is rife. The stone graveyard is dotted with crosses marking young people. More than half the residents rely on public assistance. So we saw suicide in there. Suicide, unemployment, unemployment. Welfare is that is that, is that on here somewhere? That was public the new assistance? square. So a new added squares? a bonus right. square. Now you played this game for the entire story. What did your card look like by the end of the article? I mean, it it was almost full and Mm -hmm. there were bonus squares added from this article, which I found surprising, but I also felt it was important to note that there was new ones Mm -hmm. in this particular piece. Mm -hmm. I'm actually surprised that the one excerpt you chose that we actually hit so many squares. Yeah. And um, you got? I got one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Six. Yeah, I, I've got six, too. So, oh, yeah, look at that. I yeah. got a bingo. Oh, my gosh, yes. Uh, hey, bingo, bingo. Yeah, with the free. Uh, I got the, I got a line dress. here. It's, <laughs> I got a free, with the free, with the free headdress in the middle. I managed oh to get a gosh. bingo. So on the card, it says, if you get a bingo, consider killing your story and contact a consultant at Nausea. Has anyone ever called Nausea for consultation and, and so on? We have never had that particular request yet, but we would like to receive it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, since you posted your request for an audit, the New York Times responded. 
They stood by their story and highlighted examples of the positives uh, in the community that the reporter listed. You've since had a meeting with the New York Times about this. Can you tell us what happened in that meeting? It was interesting to see the difference in perspectives, Mm. just straight up differences in the way we read it and in the way they read it. And uh, that took us a little bit of time to navigate uh, and then move beyond from that. I mean, it's surprising when you when you when you're trying so hard to have another side Uh, another view, see your perspective. And that was a challenge that we were both having in that meeting. But they, uh, in the New York Times defense, Mm -hmm. they stuck to their journalistic principles. They aim to bear witness, give voice, and hold power to account, which is what we all do in journalism. However, there wasn't very much of holding any power to account in this piece. Mm. And we agreed to continue our conversation and um, we're going to keep talking with the New York Times Mm -hmm. and uh, and, and follow up. I mean, we did our first round of newsroom training. So as an organization, we're looking at that newsroom training to see where we can implement checkpoints to make sure that the newsroom we trained is, you know, what what are they doing good in the last six months to a year and, and where do they need improvements? And We have the expertise to be able to do that, and we also have a a wide uh, network to find the expertise in various nations Mm. across Turtle Island. And what about Naja? What did you take away from this experience, considering you were just in that newsroom in May and this still happened? Uh, You know, I took away what I always take away uh, in my work is that uh, in my 20 years of working and in, in covering news, the, the landscape has changed ever so slightly. Mm. Questions are being framed differently. Uh, stories are, are getting a little bit better in providing context. And uh, the, the Twitterverse is, is very good at noticing these things and calling them out. So what I took away is that there is a lot more work that needs to be done in this landscape for stories to be properly told with the necessary context when it comes to Indigenous people and communities. Mm. Now, you mentioned some things that newsrooms um, can do to improve, to stop this from happening as they go into our communities and write about our, you know, these, these issues. Um, but what is the one thing that they could do right now in every newsroom to uh, reduce these kinds of instances? Hire an Indigenous journalist. All full stop. Period. Period. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for your time today, Francine. Thanks, Rosanna. Always a pleasure to see you. Very nice to see you, too. Francine Compton is director at the Native American Journalist Association and executive producer at APTN. To see the bingo card and use it the next time you read coverage of an Indigenous issue, visit our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. We reached out to the New York Times and they sent us a statement. Here it is in part. Our correspondent, Catherine Porter, spent weeks in Cape Dorset for the specific purpose of finding out and understanding what life is like for the people there. The issues that we recount came up repeatedly in the lives of the people we interviewed and profiled. They were frequently raised by members of the Cape Dorset community as significant, persistent challenges they wanted solved. We look forward to continuing the conversation on these important topics with Naja. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. CBC host and reporter Duncan McHugh has been working in the industry for more than 20 years. He is a Nishinaabe and a member of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. In his time working as a reporter, Duncan saw stereotypes about Indigenous people making their way into news stories and decided that he had to do something about it. Duncan joins me from Toronto. Welcome. Ah, Nina Rosanna. Ah, Tante. 
Now, in your time in the newsroom, what kinds of things did you see making it into news stories that bothered you? I'll tell you what, Rosanna, when I first started out in the newsroom in, at CBC Vancouver, and it was my own coverage that kind of bothered me. Mm-hmm. I was racing around to various parts of British Columbia in my first couple of years, what I called the blockade beat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, every time there was a, a, some sort of conflict over natural resources and the First Nation would protest raising a blockade of some kind, uh, I, I'd get sent out there to kind of report breathlessly from the front lines. And I think CBC Vancouver appreciated the the context and the coverage that I brought. But after a couple of years of that, it started to occur to me that that there were more to life in in our communities than just protests and blockades. Mm. And and, and that troubled me. And and I was also very aware that, you know, over and over and over again, our people were being portrayed as often as victims uh, in the mainstream media. And and that troubled me. And we would see stereotypes of the beaded and buckskin Indian uh, Mm. kind of showing up in the news media, in our, in our daily news. And, and so all of those things, you know, I, I began to think there's, there's more to life in our communities than, than what we're seeing on the news. For sure. Now, often in, in uh, your training, which we're going to get to in a minute, you talk about the four Ds. Can you tell us what those are? I was out covering a community and an elder came up to me and he said, you're a news reporter, eh? And I said, yeah, I am. And, and he said, uh, you know what it takes to make it on the news if you're an Indian? And I said, no, what? And he said, you got to be one of the four Ds. And I said, what are the four Ds? And he said, if you're an Indian and you want to make it into the news, you got to be drumming, dancing, dead, or drunk. And I looked at him and I thought, well, you know, that's a bit of an oversimplification. But then I started looking at our news coverage and, and sure enough, there's, there are an awful lot of those stereotypes that end up in our, in our daily news coverage. The, the cameras are fascinated by our traditional regalia or, you know, you see at so many uh, protests or gatherings, you, you see the camera focus in on the drums and, and that's what ends up in the story. And likewise, there are so many stories about dead Indigenous people and that's because Indigenous people are dying in disproportionate numbers in this country, and, and that needs to be covered. But if your only exposure to Indigenous peoples as a, as a Canadian is through popular media, mm. then you get this very two-dimensional picture of what life is like to live in a First Nation or in, in the city. Mm-hmm. Now, we've been speaking to several people today about how these misrepresentations, how these stereotypes, these tropes continue, have continued over time. Um, what's it like for you to still hear and read these misrepresentations of Indigenous people. You know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said education is what got us into this situation that we're in in Canada in 2019, and and it's education that's going to get us out. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, Canada's education system has done a very poor job of teaching all Canadians, Indigenous people included, about the history of this country, Mm -hmm. about, for example, the treaties and and the promises that settlers and and our people reached when when they first came to these shores, about how they would go forward and be neighbours in this country. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that there are many Canadians who are unfortunately ignorant about their Indigenous neighbours. And our newsrooms are composed of a wide swath of journalists from different backgrounds in Canada, but they carry the same unconscious biases that many Canadians do. Mm -hmm. They may have learned about Indigenous people only through, you know, watching Walt Disney movies, Pocahontas or Peter Pan or reading Tan Tan comics. And and those kinds of stereotypes and tropes, they've permeated our thinking. And and so they end up, unfortunately, on the front page of, of newspapers and leading newscasts. And that can do some damage to young Indigenous children and their psyche about how they see themselves. But it also does some damage about how Canadians view their neighbors. In 2011, you did something quite significant. You launched reporting in Indigenous communities to try to combat that, to to push back. Um, What is that? The online guide that I designed when I was at Stanford University is called Reporting in Indigenous Communities. And and the idea was to give working journalists some, some tips and, and guidelines to how to be more respectful when they go and visit uh, Indigenous communities. It's a tough job being mm. a reporter and the deadlines and the pressures that we face getting the news to air, I understand that. I've been there. But my argument is is that it's a lot like covering a foreign country. 
going to First Nations for some of our reporters. You wouldn't send our correspondent to Moscow or Beijing without giving them a basic course in the history of China or the Soviet Union. And likewise, you shouldn't send our reporters to cover First Nation communities or the urban Indigenous community without expecting them to have a cultural competency in Indigenous culture and protocols so that they can operate in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. There's a tension there between journalists coming in and wanting to tell a story, but I often argue that journalists are perceived by Indigenous people because of the long distrustful history as being story takers. And that's something that reporters need to be aware of before they go out and start reporting in a community. Why is that important? Why, and some people might say, well, what's the big deal? Why do reporters need to, to have this kind of training? If you don't have a, a good relationship with the, the community that you're reporting on, and if you only show up in times of crisis and people won't share their stories with you, then Canadians aren't well served by the news. And, and on top of that, when there isn't a crisis, you'll find that you have a difficult time trying to find other stories. And so I often hear journalists say, well, we would love to tell more stories about First Nation communities, but they won't talk with us. Mm. Well, if you don't spend time trying to build a solid relationship so that they understand you both in times of crisis and times of happiness and joy, then you're going to see that the coverage in your uh, newspaper or your radio broadcast is very limited, and it's only a slice of Indigenous life. When when Indigenous life is full of so much joy and happiness and sadness, and, and, and we should be sharing all of that with Canadians. The CBC, of course, uses your RIC training in, in our newsrooms across the country. What are some of the things that, that reporters tell you as they go through the training? CBC, a couple of years ago, uh, decided to start offering this reporting in Indigenous communities training to our, our stations right across the country. And so uh, myself and, and Megan Fiddler there at CBC Winnipeg and, and Wabagiji Grice from CBC Sudbury, we have visited with, with hundreds of, of CBC's journalists. And we, we hear all kinds of questions. You know, we encourage people to ask dumb questions. Mm -hmm. You know, it, people get very nervous when they start to talk about race in this country. They don't want to offend anybody or they're afraid of... of seeming to be politically incorrect when they didn't mean to be. But we encourage people to ask dumb questions and, and you know, maybe make fun of themselves when they're doing it and the <laughs> lack of knowledge that they may have. But people will appreciate that they're trying to understand a culture that, that they may not come from. Uh, we also uh, encourage people to understand the concept of Indian time. And, and yes, uh, you know, you and I can say that, but I, I say to our non-Indigenous friends, you know, uh, maybe be cautious about where you say Indian time, but that, that notion uh, that we have a different conception of, of time as in, Indigenous peoples in a traditional setting, you know, that doesn't mesh very well with newsroom deadline time. But you need to appreciate it if you're going to operate in an Indigenous community in a respectful way. And that means maybe getting a little bit of overtime for your camera so you can show up early. Or it means maybe this story doesn't need to be on the news today. Maybe that's our, our deadline and it's something that we're worried about. But maybe we should take an extra day or two and do a little bit of slow reporting on this. And then the community will begin to, to appreciate where we're coming from. Now, the training itself is fairly extensive. But could you give maybe one or two examples of what you might offer journalists when reporting in Indigenous communities? Terminology is another one that, that people get hung up on, and, and it's important. Words, words matter, and, and I understand that. But what we teach people is that it's best to just ask people where they're from and how they identify, and, and sometimes it can be a very complicated name, and so it's good to, for example, record it so that you know how to pronounce it when you come back to the studio, and the difference between Indigenous and Native and, and uh, First Nations and Métis, non-status, all those kinds of things. We go over terminology, and, and those kinds of terms matter uh, because we've seen over and over again, unfortunately, reporters in Canada using them incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Now, just a few minutes ago, we were uh, talking about a recent New York Times article about Inuit, and it wasn't well received by the Twitterverse and the community. Um, why are we still seeing these kinds of challenges when it comes to reporting on Indigenous people and communities? We see poverty porn, I'm mm. afraid, because some journalists have a, a tough time checking their own biases at the door when they go to our communities. They 
unfortunately think that they're recording real life. They're trying their best to be objective, but they bring their own perspectives into the reporting and the kinds of pictures that they choose or the kinds of video that they shoot. And there's a lot of power in those pictures and that video and that perspective. And so often the complaint that we hear from our Indigenous subjects is that we don't spend time explaining the context of how uh, the poverty came to be. Mm -hmm. I often say that that journalists suffer from colonial amnesia in the same way <laughs> that Canadians do. And, and I understand as a journalist, it's difficult to fit the entire history of the Indian Act uh, or the constitutional rights of Indigenous people into an 800-word print story or a one-minute 15 radio segment. But that said, there are lots of ways that, that journalists can include more context. And I'll keep going back to education, Rosanna, because the fact of the matter is journalists need to be part of teaching that history to Canadians that they didn't get in their elementary and their secondary and their post-secondary schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said that the mainstream media needs to be part of reconciliation in this country. Now, setting that, that uh, New York Times article aside, are you seeing improvements in how journalists tell our stories? I am a relentless optimist, Rosanna, <laughs> and, and, and I really do feel since I don't know more and, and that wave of Indigenous people starting to really communicate to journalists the problems they were seeing in our coverage, I think we have seen an improvement. And I am seeing young journalists that I'm teaching at, at journalism schools who want to change and who are investing more time in learning the cultures and protocols of the communities that they're going to cover. And that's only going to make a difference uh, as we go forward. Thank you so much for your time today, but, Duncan. Jimmy Gwich, Rosanna. Agosani. Duncan McHugh is a reporter at CBC and the host of Cross Country Checkup. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia's Faculty of Journalism. To learn more about the Reporting in Indigenous Communities online guide, visit our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today we're talking about how Indigenous people are represented in the media. It's something my next guest has thought a lot about. Carmen Robertson is co-author of the book Seeing Red, a history of natives in Canadian newspapers. She is Lakota and Scottish and a professor at Carleton University. Carmen, welcome. Thank you. When Seeing Red was published in 2011, it was a groundbreaking study of mainstream media in Canada, and you examined how the press covered stories related to Indigenous people from 1869 to 2009. What was your main finding? Well, what we were somewhat surprised by was how little things improved from 1869 to 2009. The consensus was that maybe we hadn't gotten it right, but actually we had gotten it right and things have not improved that much. The stereotypes that we found in the 19th century, they're still being reproduced and maybe different descriptor words were being used. The same themes and stereotypes were still there. And so the the stereotypes that you found, what 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 did you what did you see over that time? Well, there are some really classic tropes that we find in not only newspapers but in popular culture more generally. Early on, uh, we found uncivilized being used. Drunkenness is a a key trope that we saw again and again over time, mm. savagery, things like that. And although terms morph over time, they don't necessarily go away. Mm. What is the harm in using stereotypes in reporting on Indigenous people? Well, I mean, it's so facile, it, it, it really doesn't make much sense. Uh, you don't get a good sense of who people are. And over time, what ends up doing is it reproduces and and sort of confirms the stereotypes that people hear in other parts of popular culture. Mm. How do you see the influence of colonialism playing out in the media coverage? It's uh, pervasive. We see uh, the the shaping of the narrative 
is within the structure, the colonial structure, and that doesn't change over time. For example, you know, the Indian Act is something that comes up over and over throughout the coverage, and we see that frame and all aspects of control of Indigenous people's life through that colonial arm of the Canadian government being reproduced again and again. So that helps control the narrative. That is uh, the colonial voice that comes through. It's not the voice of Indigenous peoples that we're hearing in the press. It's the reportage of the quote-unquote other or the imaginary Indian that we see again and again. Mm. There's a lot of talk about objectivity in journalism, that journalists are just reporting, quote, the facts. What do you think about that? I don't agree with that. I think that everybody is influenced by what's happening around them. Journalism, media, uh, falls prey to those same sorts of perspectives and positionings. And so I don't think that journalism is all that objective. Can you give an example of what you mean? Well, for example, early on in our research related to Seeing Red, we uh, took on some chapters such as coverage of treaties, things like that. And at that early period, we see uh, that really the reporters didn't have any sense of who an Indigenous person was. They fall directly into stereotypes and were reproducing things that they had read in literature. And so it really was not an objective representation And so we thought, okay, that's something that happened in the 1870s. Of course, we expect that. But what we also found when we followed through our research was in the 1970s and 1980s, we were seeing journalists reproducing those kinds of stereotypes again and again. So uh, the objectivity wasn't so much there. What we saw instead was people understanding their own biases and and reporting those. In your book, you refer uh, to the media as a kind of national curriculum. What did you mean by that? Well, a lot of people uh, learn about topics from the press. For example, in Canada, when uh, we look to major newspapers like the Globe and Mail, like the National Post, for coverage of things, what we learn from that information becomes a form of educational training. And uh, so we see these kinds of stereotypes being reproduced, and that reinforces and reproduces those ideas again and again in people's minds. So it becomes a kind of education. Now, your book is included in the curriculum and classes at some universities. But when it first came out, what was the response to it? Well, it's funny because uh, mainstream media really kind of ignored it. And it was um, surprising to us that it was uh, Indigenous news outlets that were the most interested in embracing what we had to say early on. Now, over time, we've uh, had good feedback and success uh, in journalism classrooms, in Indigenous studies classrooms about what's in the book. Mm -hmm. You're currently working on an update of Seeing Red, and it's been what, 10 years since it was first published. Are you are you seeing changes in how the media cover stories related to Indigenous people? Well, it's interesting because we're seeing a lot of changes in the media per se. Uh, when we started this, uh, this project originally in 2008, most people got their news from newspapers. And the news cycle was one that... Uh, Uh, started every day and you got your news in the morning. But now with a 24-hour news cycle and uh, with people getting their news from so many different sources, that's the biggest difference we see. And therefore, that there's such a range of reportage out there from trained journalists to people commenting uh, on stories. And that is manipulating ideas and uh, perception. How do you think that the industry is going to change in the future? Are they going to change or are we just going to keep seeing the same thing over and over? Well, I think there definitely is a a will for some change, but uh, it's far more incremental than uh, we'd like to see. I do believe that journalism programs have taken up the calls to action that the TRC recommended in 2015. And so we will see change, and we do see change, of Indigenous people covering 
uh, topics in different ways all the time. But it is uh, the case that, you know, the press has been around for a long time and those ideas are deeply entrenched. I mean, those stereotypical tropes and ideas, and uh, it can't change overnight. Well, let's hope it doesn't take another couple hundred years. Yeah, let's hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Carmen Robertson is co-author of the book Seeing Red, A History of Natives in Canadian Newspapers. She's Lakota and Scottish and a professor at Carleton University. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. We're talking about the issues that arise when journalists cover Indigenous stories. Journalists for Human Rights is an organization that wants to see more Indigenous people get into journalism to cover these stories themselves. In 2014, they launched the Indigenous Reporters Program, which encourages people living on reserves in northern Ontario to learn how to be journalists. Since launching, the program has visited 16 communities in Ontario, and in the future, they hope to expand to other provinces. Lee Noonan is the field coordinator and is based out of Thunder Bay, where she offers training to Indigenous people from the city and the nearby Fort William First Nation. The Indigenous Reporters Program started five years ago with a pilot program that we called the Northern Ontario Initiative, where we worked in uh, communities in northwestern Ontario, providing media training to community members. And based on that pilot, we grew it into the form it takes now, which is an eight-month program where we go into community and a journalist is posted there to work with community members to tailor programming to the needs and the interests and skills of, of people in each community. And we also do training here in Thunder Bay, uh, previously in Sioux Lookout. Overall, the goal of what we're doing is to increase the quality and quantity of Indigenous voices and stories in media. We're just nearing the end of an eight-month term right now. So uh, at the moment, we have trainers working in Nibinamic First Nation, Deer Lake, Fort Albany. Uh, I myself am here working in Thunder Bay and with Fort William First Nation. And as well, uh, we're working with Iskatwa Zakaikan 39, Shoal Lake 39 First Nation on the Manitoba border. The goal of the program is to get more Indigenous people working in the field of journalism. The hope is that in doing so, more stories will be written about issues impacting Indigenous people. Indigenous people represent about 5% of the population in Canada. The last survey, media monitoring survey we did, showed that only about 1% of stories in Canadian media touch on them, so it's not representative. And I would argue that quite a few stories that might be labeled Indigenous stories are actually stories that broadly affect Canadians. You know, a, a treaty-related story, for example, does not affect only one party to that treaty. And so, you know, I think the proportion at which we're reporting uh, Indigenous stories is vastly lower than what it should be just to achieve some kind of proportionality. And in addition to that, the stories are usually not being reported by Indigenous people. There's a a richness and a depth of understanding that you cannot get reporting from outside of a community and outside of a population. I think those voices are really missing. Uh, Here in Thunder Bay, for example, uh, the youth who are coming here, going to school here, um, sometimes suffering serious violence here, are never the ones telling that story. That story is always told by people in authority, by journalists, maybe by adults in the community, but you almost never hear the voice of those youth. And that's a big part of what we want to be doing here in this city is giving the the young people in this city a chance to express themselves, to tell their own stories, to bring their perspectives to the issues that they're facing. What Indigenous people can offer the field of journalism is a deeper understanding of the issues impacting their communities.
everyone has their blind spots and and generally speaking the media is richer the more uh, different voices and perspectives we're bringing to our storytelling to our story gathering and indigenous people in particular have been left out of the media so far through the history of this country and and indigenous issues and stories are integral to the fabric of of our country in addition to that, you know, when we think about journalism as something that is here to, to you know, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, well, I mean, the, the absolute worst living conditions in this country are on remote reserves. There's only so much you can teach uh, someone about another culture, about another context, whereas you can absolutely bring the tools of journalism to, to anyone, anywhere. And that's what we are trying to do with our program, is to, to help people tell their own stories and to bring those tools into communities. Seth Leslie Sabarin is a high school student living in Thunder Bay, but he's originally from Pickmobert First Nation. He joined the Indigenous Reporters Program this summer to learn how to make podcasts. I am involved recently with this program. First introduced to them this summer uh, when I did a podcasting one-on-one with them with Ryan McMahon. What attracted me to podcasting was to get more experience in media, which I don't really know much about. I wanted to learn new skills so that I could be used in the future. But Ryan is was fun to work with, and he helped me to record a podcast. Before joining the program, Seth didn't pay too much attention to the news, but now he says it's important for Indigenous people to be informed. I believe for Indigenous folk out on the reses there, it's important to stay connected with media and to get more involved with journalism because it allows us to more let people know what's going on within the reses that are disconnected from everyone, as well as giving something for the community there to do, like letting them know what's going on for themselves, which I find a lot of people don't know what's going on. In the news, like I just started to listen to the news recently. Uh, Before that, I was always heard secondhand from my mom or my grandma who actively watch news. Instead of focusing on negative news stories, Seth wants to share positive stories from his community. And he's even working on a podcast. So I am working on a uh, podcast that I'm calling The Voice of Generations. We're taking four people from four different generations. So we got elders, um, parents, adults, that age range, and young, young adults, so between 15 to 30, and then youth. And asking them about the situations they're in, like... Uh, their ideas on language or their how they fe- felt coming to a city or living on a res or not even being to a res before but still be native i want to get people's good stories what they're doing in their life are something happy that happened to them a story that makes them feel good that was seth leslie sabarin a student in Thunder Bay who is part of the Journalist for Human Rights Indigenous Reporters Program. He's working on his podcast, The Voices of Generations, and his ultimate goal is to start a media company. To learn more about the Indigenous Reporters Program, visit jhr.ca. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Zoe Tennant, Kyle Muzika, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I go say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.